de ZLC se encuentra en la calidad de los programas formativos, en el alto nivel de los resultados de investigación y en la pertenencia al MIT Global Scale Network que nos imprime un marcado carácter internacional. MIT chose to come to Aragon because it was clear to us that Aragon is invested in logistics. It has been becoming a center of logistics for distribution for the entire Iberian Peninsula, attracting companies, and it became a hub of activity for logistics. My name is Hanil Khatib, I'm from Syria. I have been working in the supply chain for 11 years. The impressive part was uh, being surrounded by 180 students. We had the chance to work together. I'm very curious for what's coming next. Hello, my name is Nadia, I'm from Germany. I worked as a supply chain planner. What we do here is to learn about analytical methods, supply chain concepts, but we also applied the knowledge in a practical thesis project, and this is what makes the knowledge really stick to me. ZLC es un trampolín para juniors y para profesionales del sector de la supply chain y además una llave de entrada fantástica para recién graduados que quieran desarrollarse en el mundo de la logística. ZLC, junto con el apoyo del gobierno de Aragón, se ha consolidado como un hub de talento para las empresas. Hey, hello everyone and welcome to this live webinar in partnership with the Zaragoza Logistics Center. I am Gabriel from Doxy and I'm glad to be here today with Marta Romero, Director of, Inter of International Masters, and Marcela and Candela, Students Ambassadors. I see that more participants are joining, so again, welcome and thanks for participating in this live webinar with the Zaragoza Logistics Center. If you have any questions during the event, please feel free to drop them into the Q&A box at any time, and we will take them in the last part of our event. So I now leave the floor to Marta, Marcel, and Candela, who will introduce the Master in Supply Chain. Welcome and thanks for being with us today. Okay, thank you so much, Hilaria, for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody. I'm seeing uh, some of your names and uh, I believe that uh, you're from uh, all over the place, uh, which is uh, what we really like in the program. Uh, together with me today are two of our current students, so Marcela Nuña, who is a student from Mexico, and Candela, who is a student from uh, Spain. So thanks to the both of them uh, for joining us today. I know they're very busy, so I'm even more thankful that uh, they can join uh, They can join us today and also so that uh, they can have uh, some answers to your questions. So without any further ado, uh, let me start with the presentation. And as Hilaria said, so any questions, just uh, drop them on the, uh, on the uh, uh, chat and then uh, we will be happy to answer at the end. OK, let me share my screen with you. I hope that you can uh, see it. OK, so let's start. Um, this is a picture that was taken last year at MIT. Uh, that's very important for us uh, when we go to MIT in January as part of the program. I will be uh, providing you with more information uh, later in the presentation. We're very pleased that uh, our program is ranked number one masters in supply chain. And that's a recognition that uh, we appreciate uh, very much. This is a picture of a uh, scale network. Uh, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the supply chain and logistic excellence uh, network. We're part of it uh, since our creation back in 2003. Uh, we uh, are associated with the Center for Transportation and Logistics, as you can see on the screen. So the Center for Transportation and Logistics was founded in 1973. And the creation of uh, CLC 20 years uh, ago, uh, we're actually going to celebrate our 20th anniversary uh, sometime in November, uh, was, as I mentioned, uh, created in 2003. Uh, how did this happen? Uh, it was uh, by pure coincidence. Uh, Josie Sheffy, who was the director and continues to be the director of the CTL at the time, uh, met the director of the University of Zaragoza in, uh, in an event in the UK, and they decided that given the uh, uh, location of Zaragoza, why not replicate what uh, they had at MIT? 
So that was said and done. And here we are 20 years later. So more center joined the network um, later. So the Center for Latin American Logistics Innovation was in 2008. And then more recently, uh, Malaysia in 2011. And uh, the two newcomers uh, who have been around already for uh, six, seven years are Luxembourg, also in Europe, and uh, China. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of programs that are being taught by the different programs. Uh, there's uh, different partners. And in all, the, so uh, tw around 200 corporate partners. If you think about the location of um, uh, our center, so we are in, in Zaragoza. For those of you that do not know a lot of uh, geography uh, from Spain, uh, so Zaragoza uh, was until recently the fifth largest city of Spain, but suddenly uh, it was on the news that uh, Sevilla is, uh, has lost some of the population, so we're the fourth largest city of Spain. So as you can see, we're pretty close to the four main cities in, uh, in Spain, but also uh, some of the main uh, uh, countries in Europe. It is important that, uh, that now uh, Marcela and, and Candela let you know uh, what it is like to live in, in Zaragoza, because yes, I mentioned that Candela is from Spain, but she's from another part of Spain, and also she's been living in the U.S. for quite some time. And uh, Marcela, as, uh, as I mentioned, I don't know if they heard me before, so she's from Mexico, and they've been living in Zaragoza since uh, the beginning of the program. So you want to share your uh, experience living in Zaragoza, girls? <laughs> of course. Thank you, Marta. Can you listen to us? Yep, yeah, perfect. Perfect. So living in Zaragoza is amazing, especially because we're right in between Madrid and Barcelona. So we have two big cities really close to us, but we're still in a peaceful city. We get to uh, eat in a lot of different restaurants. Zaragoza is super cheap. So to be honest, it's a, it's a great city to live in. One other thing for the people that like food, Zaragoza uh, has amazing restaurants. In my opinion, it's even better than some of the restaurants in Madrid or, or Barcelona, or even Alicante, which is the city I'm in from. And one of the things that I like the most about Zaragoza is their people. The, the people that live in Zaragoza are known because they're super nice to everyone. They're always willing to help. So that's, that's, a, that's very welcoming when you're joining a new city and you're not from, from that country. So I even, I'm from Spain and I've had that experience. So I, I'm, I'm imagining it's something that will happen to people, even though they're not even from Spain. So, and, yeah. and also like inside the sea, you also feel that, that vibe, like you literally feel it's super warm inside TLC. You were not just like students, like we're a family inside TLC and all of like Marta and all the team that they're literally, we tell them that there are our moms and aunts. So you, you feel like home. Thank you. So uh, yes, and it's a very convenient city, the size of the city. I mean, for those of you that uh, come from uh, big countries as well, uh, it has the perfect size. Uh, let's say that it's uh, 700,000 people living in Zaragoza. And also, I mean, uh, you can go from, uh, let's say that it's a 30 minute uh, city. You can go anywhere at any point uh, in 30 minutes. And some of the students uh, do come to the center by uh, scooters. Uh, if not, uh, the, the center is strategically uh, located as well, and you will see in the next slides. So this is a picture of where we are. And officially, uh, the center is a research and educational institute on supply chain management. So our mission was to create an international center of excellence. So as I mentioned, 20, re 20 years already of, uh, of not only the program, uh, uh, Marcela and Candela are going to graduate, they are the 19th generation, but also are, we are engaging with the industry and the sector to develop and disseminate the knowledge. We are of course affiliated uh, both to the University of Zaragoza and to MIT. So as I mentioned, the University um, of Zaragoza is going to, to be uh, uh, the, the granting degree institution, but uh, we are in partnership with MIT and we've been in partnership with MIT since our creation in 2003. Uh, these are some pictures of our campus. As you can see, they are brand new. We uh, moved there, in fact, in uh, 2019. And uh, uh, these are some of the the lecture hall. This actually where most of the classes will take place. Um, we also have a secondary class, uh, which is the classroom. Uh, that one, we will only use it in case uh, that uh, the lecture hall is used by the Spanish uh, master program. But as you can see, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a new center. 
Uh, we have uh, amazing facilities for the students. Uh, they have uh, study rooms so that they can study, uh, so that they can work on their thesis projects, so that they can interview whenever they are interviewed. We have a more comfy area like the library. Uh, they even can play uh, chess. One of our professors left, uh, left a chess uh, um, board uh, for people to work. And as you can see, we also have a cafeteria that uh, thankfully was reopened after COVID and uh, that everybody can use nowadays. If we talk about the, the programs that we're going to mention today, uh, we have two uh, as part of the international program. So one is the CELOC program, which is the program Marcela and Candela enrolled in. And then uh, we have a, a second itinerary of the master's program, which is the blended program. Of course, uh, we are very, very happy about uh, the recognition that uh, we are getting. Uh, uh, we are number one in El, uh, El Mundo. It's a Spanish newspaper and we've been uh, number one uh, for 12 consecutive years. So if there are any Spanish candidates out there, uh, that they know about this uh, survey that is uh, done by El Mundo not only about the programs in supply chain, but all the programs uh, uh, in different, uh, um, uh, let's say, uh, well, in, in different topics, right? Uh, then of course, uh, we are number one in the MIT scale, as I mentioned, together with the other uh, sister centers. And in the SEM world, uh, we're ranked number four. And this is the person that I was talking to you about earlier. So he is actually the reason why we're all here. Uh, because it was uh, thanks to him that uh, the center was created, that the program was launched. And a few years back, so when he decided, uh, let's bring education to everyone, uh, he decided to create uh, the MicroMaster, uh, giving the opportunity for people to have access to online courses and then get accreditation. And after that, he decided, okay, I'm going to launch it here at MIT. And I'm going to launch it at the same time at uh, Zaragoza because I know that it's going to be very successful. And that's uh, what happened uh, with the creation of the blended program. Uh, if we talk about the program, uh, the, the, this let's say that are the, the key concepts. Uh, so the program uh, lasts roughly uh, 10 months. Uh, it's more nine months and a half uh, with some period of orientation. It's fully taught in English by international faculty members. We have professors from uh, Greece, from Cuba, uh, from Turkey. We have uh, uh, visiting professors who come from Brazil, uh, from Argentina, uh, from uh, uh, Costa Rica. Uh, so we have a very international uh, faculty body as well as we have for, for the CELO class itself. It's a small class size. We're never going to have more than a uh, 25, 30 students in the class. And uh, as Marcela mentioned, so uh, for us, it is important that students are not a number. So students are really a family. I mean, uh, and this is how we can uh, fully dedicate our time to them. I mean, if we had like a, a, an MBA class, uh, 200, 300 people in the class, that would be impossible. And also the lecture hall can, can only fit uh, 56 people. So <laughs> it's also important to have into account. It's full time, as I mentioned, it includes three weeks at MIT. And uh, one word uh, that always comes to my mind uh, when I see the profile of every, cl every class is that it's very diverse. I mean, uh, we will see the profile, uh, the general profile, but diversity uh, for the program is very important. This could be how the, the program is uh, structured. So uh, this is 10 months, <laughs> right? Uh, so as I mentioned, the orientation week period, uh, uh, students are going to see some uh, preparatory sessions. There's going to be uh, some uh, um, career uh, court, uh, seminars uh, by one of our, our colleagues. And also there will be uh, some uh, team building activities, right? Uh, so this can last between one and two weeks. And then uh, uh, everything moves on very fast. It's going to be very intensive. I mean, uh, I'm sure uh, Candela and uh, Marcela can vouch for that. So uh, from, uh, let's say, beginning of September until December, that's where the core courses, the main co core courses are going to be taught. And let's say that the focus here is going to be systems and methods. So there's uh, uh, the list of uh, courses that are there, there and that are being taught uh, by uh, these are uh, the permanent faculty members that are teaching most of these classes, except for the SNOP, which is one of our visiting professors that I forgot that is from Germany. Um, so these are some of the classes until December. Then we move on to, to the period where we are at MIT, and here the focus is going to be leadership and management. 
the Center for Transportation is going to host the visit of all the scale centers. So it's going to be an amazing opportunity for our students. And here, so not only there are going to be uh, some uh, some classes, but there are also going to be some challenges, some uh, some other uh, uh, activities that uh, we will explain uh, in detail later. And then, of course, uh, we are at this stage now that it's more the, the specialization. There are still some core courses uh, for everyone, but it's also uh, the time when we offer the electives. So the electives are after we have a meeting with our faculty members during the fall, we decide, OK, these are going to be the electives that are going to be offered to the students. The program is going to require that you take two, but you can take uh, this year we offer three. Uh, because we also have into consideration the uh, interest of the students. And in order to make it operative, we need to have at least five people interested in each of the courses. And then, of course, it's uh, time to focus on their thesis, which is what they've been doing uh, for the past, uh, let's say, three, almost four weeks. So we really uh, concentrate the teaching uh, from February until, let's say, third week in April, and then to allow the students not only to finish uh, their thesis project, which is uh, like the big milestone of the, the, the program, uh, but also some of those who are uh, currently interviewed that they get the opportunity to have some time also for the interviews. And here is a scale connect. So you can see on the picture uh, uh, front row, you can see Marcela. I don't know if we can, can, can we see you, uh, Candela, were you there on, on the picture? Uh, in the first mm -hmm. one, no, but in the second one, yes. and we're all there. I wasn't in Boston yet. I was a little late. <laughs> You're right, late. Okay, so th these are actually photos from uh, from uh, last January. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, the weather uh, was uh, not so nice that day, but uh, we were very happy that the weather this year was not so bad. It, it, it was bad at the beginning, and it was bad the day that uh, at we At the were end. Uh-huh. And... Uh, uh -huh. uh, this is uh, the typical weather in Boston in January. Uh, so here you, you, you can see like uh, pictures of, uh, of the students and uh, pictures of, of uh, some of the, the, the speakers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll hand it over to, to the girls uh, to let you a little bit more about the experience at MIT. Thank you, Marta. So, well, the experience at MIT was amazing, especially because of the networking part. As Marta said, MIT is more about leadership. Like in CLC, we have all the, the core courses and the elective courses. And in MIT, we had a lot of talks with uh, VPs from important companies. Uh, and we got like entrepreneurship classes. We had a small uh, supply chain challenge. Like it's like a small thesis in two weeks. So you get to know people from other programs and to work with them and to realize that CLC's program is super strong. Like when we were working with people straight from MIT, people from Luxembourg, we were like, okay, like we're super well prepared in comparison as well. So uh, MIT was, was great. And the networking and the connections that you make at Boston are long lasting. We met a lot of people from other centers, from MIT, from Luxembourg, that we still talk nowadays. We created a WhatsApp group. We added everyone on LinkedIn. So we're con constantly connected to each other. And we see when they get a job, and we congratulate them, and they do the same thing back. So I think that 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 is one of the most important things. And one thing that also surprised me about going to MIT, everyone was in love with Zaragoza. <laughs> all the professors, all the alumni, they were like, when are we gonna do the scale MIT in Spain? We're tired <laughs> of Boston, let's go to Zaragoza. And even the professors, because Zaragoza is a very important center. So everyone knows that around the program and gives them the importance that it should have. So we felt very recognized in, mm -hmm. in Boston from the day we arrived until the day that we left. So it was a very, very intense and very fun three weeks at, at Boston. Yeah, we were also known as the as the fun center, like in the beginning. <laughs> and we got to, we created a video uh, to introduce all of us. So we saw all the videos of all the centers and everyone after those videos, they were like, oh, you're from Zaragoza, you're the fun center. <laughs> so yeah, we learned a lot. It's super intense. Like we always say that November flew. For us, November, we were no people, but uh, even if it's intense, like you look at each other and you laugh. So that's super good. Yeah, it's it's better to laugh, huh, right? <laughs> Sometimes you laugh while crying, but you still laugh. 
<laughs> no, I must say that the video that they put together was amazing. And uh, I mean, it's not because they are CLOG students, but uh, their video was the best. And uh, also just to add on that, uh, it's uh, uh, three weeks of uh, a full program. So our colleagues at MIT do an amazing job as well. And uh, they, they try to have uh, at least one student from each center in, uh, in the case, in, in the competitions or in the challenges. And uh, that's not always so easy to do. And uh, yeah, uh, I would also say that uh, the, the, the key word here is uh, networking. Networking uh, not only with the students from all the different centers, but also with uh, the companies that uh, we're also going to, to mention after. And um, last year, uh, we still had some people last year, I say yeah, last year, but it was last January. Um, we had around 150 students from the different centers attend MIT Scale Connect. Um, some of the students were left behind because of visa or still because of uh, some uh, COVID issues. Uh, we're hoping that uh, next year everybody will be able to go in person. So the next thing that uh, that uh, we have as part of the program, at, which is very important to us, is the exper experiential learning. Uh, how does this happen? It happens through uh, a partnership. So this is the Zaragoza Academic Partner that you can see on the screen. Um, this this program was created back in 2008, and uh, since its creation, uh, we've worked with uh, a good number of companies uh, of companies over uh, 40 nowadays. So these companies uh, that we work with are, are proposing a specific challenge. It's going to be a, a problem that they're facing in their uh, supply chain and that they would like uh, for the students to be able to help. So in principle, uh, the students, uh, um, the, the companies get approached by us during uh, the summer. Uh, we get a description of the project and uh, we request for the companies to come and present those projects in uh, mid-September. By that time, of course, uh, you would have worked on your uh, scaled resume. Uh, you would have worked with uh, our colleague, Mar, uh, who is the person who's going to help you with career and uh, and with uh, assigning the, this thesis project. And uh, what we do is uh, we send your resumes to, uh, to, the, um, to the company. So depending on uh, the relationship with the company, the company usually has like uh, three options. One would be, uh, OK, from this resume book that you send me, I think that these people have the skills that I will require for my project. So I want to interview Martela, Candela, uh, whomever. Uh, the second option would be, OK, I'm going to be in Zaragoza the whole day, or I can be online and I can interview as many people as interested in my project. So whomever is interested in the project, I'm happy to interview. And then, of course, with some of the companies that have, we've been working for many years now, it's like, OK, just give me two students. I'm sure that uh, you will uh, give me two good students for my project. So the projects usually are uh, teams of two people, except for uh, Candela, for instance. Uh, uh, her team is of three people. And we will assign uh, one of our faculty members who is going to be an expert on the topic. So the project usually uh, has its kickoff meeting uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, submission is mid-May. Uh, now the students, so you, that's why you see them so relaxed. So they submitted their project uh, on uh, on on Monday, actually, and uh, now they are going to receive comments from uh, two other faculty members. So the final submission day is going to be next Monday, and uh, the, the the students will get to present their findings and their results during the research expo, which is also another milestone just before graduation. Um, this would be uh, our academic partners. So as you can see, uh, so of course, uh, the, uh, Marcela and Candela will tell you a little bit more about their projects they're working on without saying which company they work for. Uh, but uh, as you can see, so we've been working uh, with 3PL, with uh, consumer goods, with pharma, uh, with uh, consulting firms, oil and gas, uh, you name it, electronics, uh, pharma, I think I said, uh, chemical companies, every single sector that it's there. So we're very proud of this connection that uh, we have uh, from uh, from the, with these companies, uh, because not only they, they sponsor uh, these thesis projects, they, they also sometimes uh, do come and recruit. And some of the companies that uh, have worked with students on the project, they later decided to hire them. Uh, so girls, could you like to, to say a little bit more uh, uh, regarding your projects? Yeah, of course. So uh, my project 
was in a, a fruit company. So we redesigned the network for the EMEA region. This company imports mostly like 70% of their product from America, from Peru, Mexico, and mainly. So what we're doing is we're redesigning the network to uh, produce regional um, in Spain, Portugal, Morocco, and Senegal. So this project was like, we literally connected the dots of four main topics that we saw with our professors in the in the core courses and our thesis advisor Marta as Marta said one of the researchers the faculty members uh, he's an expert in all four of, of the topics so we got a lot of guidance and well this project as Marta said we submitted it on Monday that's why we're so happy and the results were amazing like you get to know and you get to realize how impactful can the subjects and the learnings that we had all along the year can be in your in your thesis and well that's the, a bit of a summary of what I of what I did for my thesis project and for me and I think that that is one of the most important things about um this part of the program is that you have so many different companies that you can be e either in a food company or a healthcare manufacturer as I was doing a completely opposite thing. So my project was about um, increasing the end-to-end visibility into the supply chain of the client of knowing why their deliveries were being delayed, which was causing a lot of impact on their customer base and also uh, from a revenue recognition perspective internally as well. So the CEOs and the CFOs were not happy with the results of the supply chain strategy team. So they wanted to increase that end-to-end -end visibility and have a form of knowing when deliveries would be late, how and how can they prevent those deliveries from being delayed in the future. So we created a prevented method for them to know when those will happen so that they can mitigate them before it is an actual problem and that was the result we also had an academic partner which is uh, an expert in digitalization and supply chain visibility which was extremely helpful none of us had experience in any of the topics that we saw which was very interesting but challenging at the same time but very fun and you're able to work with different teammates with different backgrounds from different countries, which, which gives you a different perspective of the problem, the solution uh, throughout, which was very important and very helpful. So we're almost there. <laughs> and it was also super good. Like we had a midstream uh, presentation and that helps a lot because you all uh, get feedback, not only from your thesis advisor, but as well from your classmates and from other uh, faculty members. So that midstream presentation was super helpful to guide a bit more. And well, now we're done. So now we're happy. <laughs> and one last thing, and I promise that I'll shut up. Um, uh, you also present this in, this, in, in Boston with the other mm -hmm. centers and the other professors in Boston. So you also have the opportunity to have a total different perspective of what your uh, classmates are doing from other centers and even the professors from those centers. You receive feedback and you um, either do the feedback that they tell you or you take it and you leave it or whatever you want to do but it gives you a huge uh, for me it was a huge advantage for other professors to see it so that I could see everything more holistically yeah in fact what Candela was mentioning is it's called research expo and uh, what they do is like a showroom uh, of all the uh, in 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 a poster format uh, they get to present so for, for the participant companies, around 200, 250 executives uh, who attend, uh, they walk around the room and uh, as Candela mentioned, so they give tips, uh, uh, they ask some questions about the projects too. So that's also uh, very helpful for the students and also another opportunity to network with companies. Okay, so let's move on to the next slide. Career opportunities, so as I mentioned, um, while we say at the beginning and uh, during the admissions process when I talk to some candidates, uh, because of course, obviously, uh, not only you are interested in, in getting uh, the degree, but also what opportunities come next. Uh, we say that, uh, that the responsibility for finding a job is the student, but uh, we do have a very good system in place to try to help you as much as we can. 
Uh, we do have what we call company days where we invite companies to come and present not only their company, but also their job opportunities. We have an amazing uh, network of alumni uh, who share with us uh, their, their openings and uh, who are always willing to talk to, to, to students, to candidates like, uh, like yourself. And uh, I mean, it really is going to, to depend on, on each year. At the beginning of the, the academic year, things were not looking up so good, but uh, things are looking pretty nice uh, now uh, for our current cohort. And uh, they are securing job offers as we speak. And uh, hopefully by uh, maybe two, three months after graduation, everybody will have secured uh, a job in, in a multinational or not, uh, in a small company. I mean, it really depends uh, as long as uh, people are happy. Uh, so this is Nimesh. I mean, uh, you can uh, read what he had to say. So Nimesh is a senior uh, because he did the program back in, in 2009. Uh, so he's from India and uh, he's currently working as Global Network Modeling Senior Manager at Snyder Electric and he's working in Australia. So uh, there are a lot of people who uh, prefer to stay in their country of origin. Some other people prefer uh, to work in Europe or to work somewhere else. So there's going to be some challenges there um, if you do not have the, the right permit, but opportunities are there. And this would be the, the, the student profile. Uh, I mean, this is general, it's not uh, this, uh, this year's class. So as you can see, the average uh, would be uh, 31, but uh, really we do have in the class uh, people uh, who are recent graduates uh, with a little work experience, uh, but uh, where there is a lot of potential. Uh, we have people who have uh, 15, 20 years of work experience, experience that can be on supply chain or can be on something different in operations, or we even have career changers in the program. Um, the average age uh, would be seven, but as I mentioned, so people on on different on both ends. Um, uh, the uh, the average also is to have thirteen countries of of origin represented in the in the current cohort. Uh, we have eleven nationalities, uh, and it's a, it's a small class size this year. We have sixteen students on the on the residential program. Um, I always say, and I won't uh, be tired of saying that we need more women in the program. Uh, here we have a very good representation uh, with Candela and Martela, but uh, we would be uh, happy and we would welcome uh, more women uh, on the program. It is not a uh, supply chain, it's not a men's job. So any women out there, uh, I would recommend you to apply for the program. I'm sure that uh, you can find a perfect career path for you. Um, if we talk about the background a little bit, so it's true that we have a, a huge percentage uh, of engineers. But we do also have people who come from business and economics and, uh, and other disciplines. In fact, all disciplines are welcome. The only thing is that on the application requirements that uh, you will now see, uh, we just need to make sure that you have the analytical skills that uh, uh, will uh, be required by the program and uh, which are really, uh, going to be very demanding. These are also some important uh, dates. So we are currently at the stage where we are on our rolling admissions. Um, so if you are an international student who is going to need a visa, uh, then let's say that June 15th would be the latest uh, that uh, we will be able to accept your application, uh, mainly because of uh, the visa situation. Uh, I don't know, Marte, how long it took you to get your visa uh, to give uh, the, the candidates an overview. Usually it's around two months. So it's going to depend on the country and on the embassy or consulate. But yeah. The, and then for uh, European. Yeah, for me. Uh, Go ahead, Marta. Sorry, Marta. Uh, for me, the visa process, it, it was super fast, actually. It took me two or three weeks, more or less. So for me, it was fast, but we have some classmates that they took them like maybe one month, two months, depending on the nationality. But in general, like the requirements are not tough. The thing is you have to do it with time and that's it. If you if you get to the embassy, like all the requirements, you will have it uh, regardless your nationality. So it's only about planning and doing it with time. I mean, if you're admitted and you get uh, the papers uh, from us, uh, since the requirements may vary from an embassy or consulate from the other, uh, we from the center, we're going to provide you with the information they require. 
If you see that uh, you cannot make it uh, to arrive uh, last week in August, that's okay because uh, we have this situation this year with one student uh, who was having some issues with his visa and he joined the sessions online. So in that case, uh, you don't need to worry. And then, of course, if we're talking about uh, European students that do not need a visa, then uh, you can apply until uh, July 15th. So there's still plenty of time to apply. Uh, this could be the uh, application requirements. So there's going to be an application form uh, where you would need uh, to uh, declare. Uh, it's going to be more as a statement of objectives. Why do you want to do this master's uh, in, the, in this application form? Uh, you would need to send us your resume. If you have GMAT, SUX, or GRE scores, uh, please send them along. So this can be waived. Uh, so if you come from an engineering background, or uh, you're a math freak, uh, then uh, we will uh, uh, validate uh, this and you will need uh, to take it. We need to also receive uh, some uh, uh, English proof uh, that uh, your English is good. I mean, uh, C1 level is what we will require. Uh, there is a video statement where we can, of course, see uh, your level of English. Uh, we will also need your transcripts and diploma and two letters of recommendation. For the recommendation, it's going to really depend on uh, how senior you are. If you've been out of the educational system for quite some time, then uh, two from uh, from industry would work. If uh, you are just a fresh graduate, well, two uh, from uh, your professors can work as well. And then uh, we have a very good financial aid program. Uh, the, the financial aid program has both scholarships as well as uh, a loan. The loan uh, can cover up to 70% of tuition and our parcel scholarships can uh, cover up to 80. So um, I'm happy that uh, both of them are awardees of our scholarships. Uh, so as part of the program, of course, the, the main requirement is going to be that uh, you're admitted to the program uh, to be able to apply. But uh, could you like to say uh, something about uh, what it meant for you guys to, to get a scholarship? Yeah, of course, Marta. Uh, well, the scholarship, of course, it's it's like two things. First of all, it's like a huge commitment because once you get the scholarship, of course, you're more than committed to, we need to have good grades. It's not that if you don't have it, you're not committed, but it's like cherry on top. And the second part, it, it releases you of a lot of stress maybe that, uh, we have a lot of things going like we have school we have uh, the cultural shock in some cases and the financial part at least it's covered so yeah we're both we both have scholarships and super proud to have it and super thankful i totally agree with what marcela said i think that it gives you one less thing to worry about in this year that you're going to be abroad which is honestly super important knowing that moving to another city and to another country where you might not be familiar with is always frustrating. So having to worry about one less thing, even if Zaragoza is cheap, which it is in comparison to the other centers that we mentioned, it is still like you still have to cover for living expenses. So if you don't have to worry about the uh, tuition of the program, it, it is a huge opportunity to just focus on, on your living expenses in Zaragoza and and your your future after the program, but not economic really worries anymore throughout. Thank you. So th this is a snapshot of all the uh, the scholarship that we have. So the uh, for those of you who are not European, not Spanish, not African, uh, then uh, we have one which is uh, for everybody. So anyone who is admitted can apply for this scholarship. Uh, uh, it's usually, I mean, uh, the uh, on the screen you can see 25 or 50 percent. Usually the scholarships are for 20 percent uh, uh, for the general ones because we want to give more opportunity to more candidates. Uh, if you're Spanish, then uh, you have so many opportunities. I mean, uh, you have the Spanish citizen uh, scholarship that you can apply for. Uh, you can also apply for the European scholarship and uh, you can apply for the master essay competition, which is uh, the one that has uh, the biggest percentage and uh, which is actually the one that Candela uh, was awarded. Uh, so we were very proud of uh, what she uh, wrote and what she sent and uh, she was uh, uh, awarded this scholarship. And uh, then, as I mentioned, we have another one for African students, which cover 25%. And of course, uh, for women. Uh, so if you're uh, a, a woman and you want to specialize in supply chain, 
uh, we have a scholarship that can cover the 50% of, of the tuition. Uh, I think I didn't say how much the tuition is, is 24,300 euros for the CELOC residential program. And now we are going to briefly talk uh, for the sake of time in, uh, because I think that uh, you may have some questions about the uh, blended program. So the blended program will be for those students who have completed the five online courses and the micro master that I mentioned uh, while I was showing you the slide about Josie Sheffy. So the, the only thing that you need to take into consideration is that in order to be able to apply for the blended program, you need to have the accreditation and that each online course takes uh, 12 weeks uh in general and that then you need to do a comprehensive exam so we're talking about uh, 16 to 18 months to complete the program before you can really apply for the blended program uh once you have applied for the blended and you join us uh you will join us in fact at mit so it's a bit strange for us to to meet the blended people at mit and not in zaragoza but this is how the program is stru uh, structured so uh, the, the remainder of the program is going to be the same. So, in fact, you're going to be in the same class with uh, with the CELOC residential student. And the only difference is going to be, uh, as I mentioned, the, the, the electives that you're going to take. So here you can see the structure. So the, the micro courses, uh, the part about, about uh, MIT, which is exactly the same, and also the specialization part, uh, which is uh, now uh, from February until uh, May. The student profile is a little bit different here. So as you can see, uh, people turn to be a bit uh, older in uh, in this uh, in this program. They are a bit more senior. They have more years of experience. Uh, and here we're doing very poorly in terms of uh, gender. As you can see, uh, we have a, a super huge percentage of, of male. It's not that we have anything against uh, male students, but uh, then again, uh, we think that uh, any women out there um, should be cut uh, for for this program. And here we have an example. Then it's it's a long quote that, that uh, Santiago uh, gave us. Uh, you can read it from uh, from the screen. Uh, so Santiago came from uh, from Colombia, and uh, he's currently uh, he was working for DHL uh, when he joined the program. Uh, but he was working uh, for DHL in Colombia, and now he moved to DHL in Germany. Um, I don't know if you had the possibility to read his whole. Uh, uh, quote, uh, he was super impressed and he was super happy when he left the program. Okay, and here we only have two rounds. So the, the first round was January 31st. If anyone uh, attending today has completed the online courses and the micro master, uh, you should know that the second uh, round deadline is June 20th, and then uh, we will communicate our decisions a month later. So I said that uh, the program starts in January. But uh, given that you're also going to be working on a thesis project, uh, we do not look uh, for those thesis projects for the students usually. Uh, the students, they, they either come sponsored by their companies and they work on a company on a company sponsored project, or they work on an idea. And then uh, we do a matching similar to what we do with the CELOC students, but uh, uh, with different projects. And uh, so the idea is that uh, everybody is going to be able to, to have the same time to complete the master. So you would actually need to start working on your project in October, even though you're not going to be physically with us. And these are also some, some activities that uh, we've done in the past. Uh, we hope that uh, we will be able to, to, to repeat them. And uh, of course, so I mentioned the research first, uh, when the students will get to present their projects. And uh, these two ladies, uh, together with uh, uh, the other 22 students from uh, from the CELOG and CELOG-B program, uh, we have eight students on the CELOG-B program, are going to graduate on June 2nd. So that's going to be a big celebration for everyone. And I think that this is all that we have. So if you have any questions, uh, you have uh, the admissions email account here. And uh, we're open uh, for your questions now. Thank you very much, Marta, Marcel, and Candela for your presentations and sharing. I would like to tell our audience that they are going to receive the link to the recording of the webinar via email after the event, so you can rewatch it in case you missed anything. And I think we are now ready to move to the Q&A session. We have quite a lot of questions, so we'll do our best to take most of them. But in case we don't manage to do that, please feel free to reach out to Doc City or to the Saragossa Logistics Center, uh, and we will be more than happy to support you as much as, much as we can. So let's start with the questions. 
Um, we have, of course, uh, as usual, a couple of questions about scholarship, about the criteria, about how much uh, it's easy to get a, a scholarship, and if the the process to to receive to get one is uh, the same as uh, the one of. Uh, of application of uh, or if the students need to do something different to apply for a scholarship. So I don't know if Marta or maybe Marcela and Candela can share a little bit more of their experience or a little, or a little bit more details on that. Okay, Candela, you want to take this? Sure. So uh, it always depends on the year scholarship. A lot of the year scholarships are uh, and Marta, correct me if I'm wrong, financially based. So if you have a financial need, that's one of the criteria to get the new scholarship, or at least it, it would be more probable that you get the scholarship based on financial aid. And then if you are a Spanish resident, and if you're a Spanish citizen and you apply to the scholarship that I applied for, that is, um, how do I call it? Like academic based, like I had to do a paper, I had to do a research, it was very, long, a little bit stressful, a little bit challenging, but it was a, a very amazing experience. And at the end, I was uh, lucky enough to, to have the scholarship based on the results of the essay that I submitted. So I think that, Marta, correct me if I'm wrong, the only scholarship besides the loans that are not financially based. Yeah, uh, in fact, uh, I mean, uh, we do have um, some things to consider in, uh, in the application form. So it's a separate application for, for, uh, for the scholarship. And uh, as uh, Candela says, so we're going to take into account uh, the need, of course. Uh, it's also going to be granted on, on merit. And uh, I mean, th there are uh, several opportunities. So um, as I said, uh, we, we try not to offer 50% scholarship for the supply chain promising professionals uh, because we want to have uh, more people benefit from it. So depending on uh, your nationality, uh, you can apply to multiple scholarship. Of course, you cannot accumulate them, but uh, the, the more chances that you will get. I mean, if you're uh, European, uh, then you can apply uh, for several. If you're a woman, uh, then you can apply for the women's scholarship and others. So there's plenty of opportunities out there. And if you're not awarded a scholarship, then of course you can uh, apply for, for the loan. And uh, the loan, the good uh, thing it has is that uh, you, you will not need to start replay, repaying the loan, sorry, uh, until one year after graduation. So it gives you the opportunity to secure a good job and then uh, start repaying back the loan. Great, thank you both for taking the question. So I have, we have a participant asking about language requirements. So uh, they're asking if it is necessary to speak Spanish to come to the campus. And maybe you can tell us if the university, if the, if the center offers any language courses. Not at all. So Spanish is not required because the program is fully taught in English. And in fact, uh, we're going for those students uh, who do not have uh, a Spanish background, we will have some survival sessions at the beginning of the academic year. So these are going to be 20 sessions. I mean, people at the beginning, they, they take it very seriously, like, OK, we really want to learn the language. But then the program is so challenging and so demanding that the Spanish language is not going to be uh, so appreciated any longer. And uh, of course, I mean, in the city, uh, sometimes it may be a bit uh, difficult to get by because uh, in Spain, uh, in general, we're not so very good at languages, but you won't have an issue. I mean, and uh, uh, if uh, the next class is like uh, uh, the, the, the classes in the, in the past, everybody hangs out together and uh, the chances that you're going to have uh, some uh, of your colleague who is a Spanish speaker is very high. So don't worry about not speaking Spanish. Great, thank you. And uh, we also have a participant asking if he or she can work for their current company during the master. So is it possible to combine working and studying I mean, it is possible, but it's going to be very challenging. I mean, uh, if you can just uh, mention the number of hours that you dedicate to, to the program, uh, I mean, not to scare the people out there, but uh, I mean, a part of maybe 25% uh, of your time, maybe, uh, but not continue working uh, on the same rhythm as, uh, as you probably are doing. Uh, you want to, uh, to add something? 
Yeah, like we both have examples. Candela herself, she started working in the beginning and my thesis partner, he worked for the whole, uh, the whole academic year. So it's super challenging. And uh, we would recommend if you have the opportunity to have a study leave, take it. If you need it due to financial uh, terms, you can also do it. You just have to take in consideration that your working hours will be twice or thrice as uh, versus all of the other people. Thank you very much for your advice. And uh, also we have participants asking about the background which is required to apply. So Martha, you were mentioning that all uh, uh, backgrounds are welcome, but I don't know if you have maybe any uh, particular or special advice for those participants who are willing to apply and maybe they do not have any uh, background in engineering or in business. Uh, what, can it, what can they do to uh, stand out in the application process? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you don't have, uh, I mean, we had people who uh, did the program uh, who came from law, uh, geography. Uh, we had uh, quite a few people uh, from political science. And uh, actually, uh, one of the girls uh, who came from political science who, who had like, no prior knowledge of uh, supply chain uh, in uh, her transcript, you could not see something uh, similar to any type of figure. Uh, she was really uh, the best academic uh, um, award that, that, that she received that year. So if uh, this is your case, uh, I can suggest that you take SCOX, one of the online courses, uh, which is like the fundamentals of supply chain. Uh, in there, you will be able to see whether uh, you, you see it challenging or not. I mean, uh, it doesn't matter that uh, you do not come from, uh, from uh, an engineering background. Uh, for instance, this, this girl I was just uh, telling you about, uh, she really loved math and uh, she presented a, an almost perfect uh, GMAS score. So it's really going to depend. So that you come from a, a background which we would not consider typical for the program, that won't be an issue. Great, thank you very much, Martha. And what about the uh, limit in the, the number of admitted students per year? Does it changes from one year to another or is it fixed? I mean, it's not fixed, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, the, the, this year we have a smaller class size uh, with uh, 16 students in one program and eight students in the other itinerary. Um, I mean, we may have uh, 25, 30, uh, 12. I don't know. It's it's going to depend on the year and uh, on uh, on the talent of uh, of the students. Uh, we want to make sure, as as, as mentioned, that uh, uh, people have the skills for the program. Uh, we do not want for the people uh, to, to suffer during the program in the sense that, okay, why did I do this? Uh, I cannot cope with this. It's not like we, I mean, we had this situation in the past and uh, it's a horrible one uh, to have someone uh, to, to have to, to leave the program because uh, they were not fully prepared for uh, a challenging program. But uh, it's going to depend. So, so far for next academic year, we have 18 people who have accepted our offer of admission. So it looks like it's going to be um, a bit bigger uh, class size than uh, than this year, but uh, it changes from one year to the next. Thanks very much. And we have a question from Italy uh, for Marta and Candela, uh, for Marcella and Candela, sorry. Uh, what are the main advantages and challenges of the program according to your experience? Um, so advantages, a lot. Uh, our professors are great. We really have like one of our professors who graduated from MIT and Harvard and like the three of them, the, the ones that uh, give us the core courses, they're really, really, really super talented people. And they guide you through the process. As Marta was saying, even if you're not coming from an engineering background, people really get everything because of the professor's guidance. That's one of the main advantages. And the professors that come to visit, they have like uh, a really good like complement of what we are, are seeing. And then the, the residential and blended part, it's also a, a great advantage because you get to know new people in halfway in the program. So you're also starting to get to know different backgrounds. And as Marta said, they're more like experienced um, so that's really nice. And one of the main challenges, I would say, uh, time management. 
if you don't know how to manage your time, you're literally going to sleep in CLC. But if you know how to manage, you can perfectly, for example, I don't work in the weekends. And for me, Friday 2 p.m., I close my computer and they know about me on Monday again. And I could manage perfectly because if you organize yourself, you can perfectly do it. But it's, it's one of the main challenges, I would say. I know we're short on time, so I'll just say one advantage because I agree with your disadvantage. <laughs> and the advantage that I would say besides what Marcel just said is uh, your classmate. I think that um, it has been an um, it, it has been an amazing experience. You get to be super close to each other. Even at MIT, they were surprised. They were like, "You're literally like a family." And we were like, "You are not." <laughs> like what? So like we're very close to each other. We do plans in the weekends, in the afternoons, after class, before class, during class. No, I'm <laughs> during class. But um, it has been an amazing experience to know people from all over, and I think that's one of the main takeaways that I have. I'm here with Marce on vacation and I didn't know her before and now we're very good friends. So I think that's one of the main things that I get from the program. Thank you very much for your sharings, uh, Marcela and Candela. And uh, uh, I see that we still have some questions and we'll do our best, but uh, I'm afraid we are we have not time enough to cover them all but we will make sure to take all of them and uh, answer uh, your questions and your inquiries uh, via email. So uh, as Doxy or the Zaragoza Logistics Center will get back to you for sure. And also you will have the chance to review the, um, the webinar, our event, as we are going to share the links of the recording of the event. So let's move to the last couple of questions. Uh, so we have a participant who is asking what services do you offer to international students? So Martha, maybe you can share with us a very uh, quick overview of the services that you were also mentioning before. Uh, you mean career services or? Yeah, I think the participants might like uh, want to add some information about accommodation, like visas or something like very general. Okay, so we have two super women uh, working in the team. Uh, so one is uh, Clara. Uh, Clara is the coordinator of the program, and she's going to help you with everything that you may need going from uh, opening a bank account uh, to taking you to the foreign police office uh, so that uh, your visa is transformed into a student card. Uh, she's going to help you with uh, with accommodations. She's going to help you read a contract uh, that uh, the, the landlord uh, has sent you. Uh, she's also going to to work uh, uh, alongside me uh, in in everything that is academic. So in that part, you don't need to worry like uh, moving to a, a country. Uh, it's it's difficult sometimes, as uh, the the girls were saying, uh, there can be a culture shock. But uh, we're going to, uh, as mentioned also before, uh, we are a family, and we're a family since uh, the students start applying for the program, and then we're going to help you with every need. And then the other person that is very important in the program is Mar. Mar uh, takes care of, uh, she's our corporate relations manager. So uh, together with me, we secure the thesis projects for you, but she pays special attention into uh, their career development of the students. So uh, she has one-on-ones with the students uh, to review their resume, uh, to, to talk about uh, what are uh, the, the specific needs that the students have, what they would like to do after, uh, after the program, um, what positions uh, they, they, they could apply for, all this kind of thing. And she also deals with the alumni. So you're going to get a full support during the duration of the program. So from the CELOC team, the three of us, also from the professors, as uh, Marcela and Candela were saying, and uh, most importantly, from uh, the classmates themselves. Thank you very much, Marta, for taking the question. And so let's uh, pick another one. Uh, a participant, Paula, is asking if it is important to come from a recognized university uh, as an applicant. No. As I long guess as good that's the answer she was looking for. <laughs> Okay. I mean, if you come for a, from a renowned uh, university that that, are, that already says uh, something, no? Uh, Marcela was coming from uh, from a from a very good one, Candela as well. But uh, it, it doesn't really matter. I mean, uh, uh, maybe you went to a public university and uh, it was a good university as well. 
and yeah, you get uh, the uh, the education, uh, the educational background. So no, we we don't look at the names of the universities in order to uh, to filter our admission. Okay, so I think we have time for one last question. And a participant is asking about housing and meals if they are including in Saragossa, and also uh, he or she is asking about uh, the cost to traveling to Boston if they are including South Air ticket, housing, and so on. Okay, so what's included in uh, in the in the tuition fee, which is the twenty four thousand three hundred. It's uh, the tuition itself, it's the materials, uh, and it's also the three-week accommodation at MIT. So at MIT, uh, you will be sharing a studio with uh, one other classmate, uh, but that's all that it's covered. So uh, flights to Spain and to the US are your uh, responsibility as well. And uh, like transportation, uh, living expenses, as the girls were saying, so living in Zaragoza is, is not very expensive at all. So uh, accommodation, living expenses, uh, depending really if, if you share the apartment uh, with a classmate, is not going to be more than 600 euros per month. Okay, great. Uh, thank you very much for taking all the questions. Uh, I think we got to the end of our webinar. It was great to uh, see all the engagement and the interest from our audience. I would like to remind everybody that you're going to receive an email with the link to the recording of the event. So you will be able to rewatch it in case you missed anything or in case you joined us uh, after the very beginning. Uh, and I also would like to thank again Marta, Candel, and Marcella for their time and for giving the, our audience the chance to get so many precious information and advice. And last but not least, uh, I would like to thank our participants and our audience for the questions and uh, above all for their time for joining us today. We really hope that this session was useful for you and look forward to getting in touch with you again during our future events with the Saragossa Logistics Center. Thank you very much again for joining us today and stay safe. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you, Ilaria. I, I won't like to repeat everything that Ilaria just said, but uh, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, just uh, reach out to us if uh, you want to apply. Uh, there's still plenty of time, and uh, I'm sure that it will be a decision that uh, you will not regret. And I would like to thank my uh, two wonderful students uh, for joining us today. Uh, you guys did a very good job. Uh, so thank you, everyone. And uh, as I said, I hope uh, to uh, to be getting some questions and some applications soon. Thank you very much again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.